Yes, hi. So everybody, welcome. And uh, this is the um, first sort of class, uh, well, second class, but the first sort of teaching class, I guess you could say, on uh, Diamond Cutter Sutra. So um, <clears throat> the last class, uh, as you know, that I just put up, I just uh, read the sutra. So something, you know, people like we don't really do very often is just read the original text and sutras. It's so beautiful to um, to read. It's very sweet because it's um, it reminds me a lot. Like if you read um, Plato, where there's Socratic dialogues and they're asking Socrates stuff, and it's always like that, where it's just like, you know, what is justice? Is this justice? And then his friends or students always go, Oh, by Zeus, you're right. <laughs> you know, so Socrates or whatever. I always think it's sweet, like that. That's always like, yes. So, but uh, like you know, like everyone's always sort of agreeing with Buddha. But at the same time, um, you know these important uh, discussions are being sort of given out by the Buddha in these uh, sutras. So uh, this one here, uh, Diamond Sutra, Diamond Cutter Sutra, is, it was really, really beautiful to read. It's very sort of uh, mystical in a lot of ways, I found. Um, and all the sutras are kind of like that. And it's always good to um, read the original material. What you really see is that there's so many different ways of looking at it, hence all the different traditions of um, Buddhism, not just Tibetan Buddhism. There's all just sort of different uh, takes and um, readings of it. So uh, anyway, it's just, I was really, I just love reading that sutra. So <clears throat> in a lot of ways, it's just the blessedness of having long transmission or even just um, reading a sutra sort of purifies your mind. Like we're always reading the heart sutra here, but if you can read the longer ones too, I remember years ago in uh, the temple in Vancouver, um, at Sura Ling, we read the Prashnaparamita uh, full sutra in 100,000 uh, verses there, lines, and it was just amazing. Uh, you know, we read it in English, of course, not in Tibetan or Sanskrit, and it took many months for us to do. Once a week, we get together and read it, and we just meditate while we were reading it, and it was, it really did something. Like, I can honestly say, kind of at the end that we finished, it wasn't just like, oh, God, were the books this big? I'm happy we finished it. It's like it really kind of changed people's minds, you know, having read it. it was It was really beautiful. Anyway, so just uh, just that as sort of an aside, I just wanted to, to for auspiciousness, start with the uh, reading the Diamond Cutter Sutra. So now we'll read another sutra here. We'll get started with the Heart Sutra. <clears throat> Homage to perfection of wisdom, the Blessed Mother. Yes, I've heard at one time, Blessed One was dwelling in Rajgir and Mass Vultures Mountain. The Great Assembly of Monks and the Great Assembly of Bodhisattvas. In that time, the Blessed One was absorbed in the concentration of countless aspects of phenomena called profound illumination. That time also Sri Valkshar, the Bodhisattva, the great being, was looking perfectly at the practice of the profound perfection of wisdom, looking perfectly also at the five aggregates being him of inherent systems. Then through the power of Buddha, Venerable Shari put to sit Sri Valkshar, the Bodhisattva, the great being. How should a son of the lineage train who wishes to engage in the practice of profound perfection of wisdom? Thus he spoke, and Sri Valkshara, the Bodhisattva, the great being, replied to Venerable Shari put to as follows. Shri Putra, whatever son or daughter of the lineage wishes to engage the process of profound perfection of wisdom should look perfectly like this. Subsequently, looking perfectly and correctly, also the five aggregates being empty and inherent existence. Form is empty, emptiness is form. Emptiness is not other than form, and form is also not other than emptiness. Likewise, feeling, discrimination, compositional factors, and consciousness are empty. Shri Putra, like this, all phenomena are emptiness, having no characteristics. They're not produced and do not cease. They have no defilement, no separation from defilement. They have no decrease and no increase. Therefore, Shari put in emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no discrimination, no compositional factors, and no consciousness. There is no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mentality, no form, no sound, no smell, no taste, no tactile object, no phenomenon. There is no eye element and so forth, up to no mentality element, and also up to no element of mental consciousness. There is no ignorance and no exhaustion of ignorance, and so forth, up to no aging and death, no exhaustion of aging and death. Likewise, there's no suffering, origin, cessation, or path, no exalted awareness, no attainment, also no non-attainment. Therefore, Shari Pucha, because there's no attainment, bodhisattvas rely on and abide in the perfection of wisdom. Their minds have no instructions and no fear. Fasting and are beyond perversity, they attain the final nirvana. Also, all Buddhas reside perfectly in the three times, having relied upon the perfection of wisdom, became manifest, complete Buddhas in the state of unsurpassed, perfect and complete enlightenment. Therefore, the mantra of perfection of wisdom, the mantra of great knowledge, the unsurpassed mantra, the equal to the unequal man, the mantra that thoroughly pacifies all suffering, since it is not false, should be known as the truth. The mantra of perfection of wisdom is proclaimed. Tayatam, gada gada pari gada pari, sam gada bodhi soha. Shariputra bodhisattva, great being, should train the profound perfection of wisdom like this. 
Then the Blessed One arose from that concentration and said to Sri Balakshara, the Bodhisattva, the great being that he'd spoken well. Good, good, O son of Lumjan, like them. Since it's like that, just as you have revealed, in that way, the profound perfection of wisdom should be practiced, and the Tathagata has well also rejoice. When the Blessed One had said this, Venerable Shari Pujit, Sri Balakshara, the Bodhisattva, the great being, in the entire circle of um, disciples, as well as worldly beings, gods, humans, demigods, and spirits, were delighted and highly praised what had been spoken by the Blessed One. Okay, so that's uh, starting with the Heart Sutra here. Now let's just do our meditation. Might have to be a, a little bit shorter. Uh, and I'm just changing things around a little bit in the visualization just for the Diamond Cutter uh, series that we're doing right now. Okay, so we can just start by doing a uh, round of nine point breathing. And again, I'm just urging people to do it rather than to uh, close your nostrils, just to visualize, just feel the sensation of breathing the three breaths in through the left nostril and out through the right, getting rid of desire's attachment. Just feel three breaths going in from the right nostril out through the left for anger, reactivity, frustration, and so forth. And three deep breaths through both nostrils. And exhaling and on the final breath as we go in the night, just hold it at the navel, put your mind uh, at the, just a little bit below your belly button, just feeling the breath, uh, the prana and your mind all mixed together just at your navel chakra before you, you exhale. Okay, and as we slowly come out of it, just on your own time, start to visualize yourself being seated in a wide open space. Or being like Lapis Azuli, sort of soft, easy to, uh, on the touch, easy to sit on. And we can visualize ourselves surrounded by all sentient beings. So our mother on our left, father on our right, people we love the most to support behind us, people we like the least to have issues with in front of us, these objects of compassion. Then moving outward from that, just visualize all other people from around the world, human beings, countless animals from the animal world, sort of animal realm, uh, countless beings from the spirit world, from all the different uh, spirit realms, like uh, astral, ethereal, elemental planes, and so forth. Uh, beings uh, from celestial realms, demigods, Three realms of gods, like the sire gods, uh, form realm gods, uh, formless realm gods, and so forth. And then countless beings in lower states of rebirth. And these are the ones that we really center our compassion and love for beings in the hungry ghost realm, better realm, and different hells as well. And just feel that everybody's here together, all just as one kind of family, and we're all meditating together. <clears throat> And for the merit people, keep it simple again, just for these last two courses, I just because they're real teachings right from Buddha here, uh, just with um, Vasubandhu's presentation collection of all the teachings on karma, having Dharma Kosha, and now from that we're doing Diamond Cutter Sutra, we're just, I really wanted to focus uh, on uh, making connection with Buddha, Buddha himself, Buddha Shakyamuni. So we'll visualize Buddha Shakyamuni. So we're going to do a little bit different, just keep it very simple uh, for this course. We're just again just going to visualize him in the sky alone like a big sun, beautiful blue sky like a dome above us and Buddha Shakyamuni in front. 
And he's uh, has a body made of light, golden light, uh, weighing three words of a monk in this position, holding a begging bowl from the sun nectar in his left hand, right hand is uh, palm open, touching the earth in the subduing mudra. In radiating light like the sun. And again, we'll visualize, I always do this even for our sort of connection, uh, unity of sutra and tantra here. So we're gonna visualize his higher symbol Gakaya form, Vajradhar and Vajradhatu Ishvari, divine couple in, in sexual embrace. Uh, the beautiful blue, dark blue bodies like sapphire, with the crowns, ornaments, and so forth. And they're young and beautiful, and they're kissing. And uh, Vajradhar has got a uh, bell in his left hand, uh, a diamond scepter, Dorje, in his right. And she's got a, uh, in her left hand, skull top of medicinal nectar, right hand, curved chopping. Taking refuge here, I know sentient beings to achieve an open growth refuge to Buddha Dharma Sangha. I know sentient beings to achieve an open growth refuge to Buddha Dharma Sangha. I know sentient beings to achieve an open growth refuge to Buddha Dharma Sangha. Through the virtues we collect by giving other perfections, may we become a Buddha for the benefit of all. Through the virtues we collect by giving other perfections, may we become a Buddha for the benefit of all. Through the virtues we collect by giving other perfections, may we become a Buddha for the Taking refuge in Jaya and Bodhicitta, all of our behavior here reminds all of our practice going towards the enlightenment of all sentient beings. And just to visualize now beautiful white light coming down from Buddha's heart, the nectar purifying us in all sentient beings of negativities, flushing on all our bad energy and bad karma, like black smoke. It's just like in the day, just for when you go uh, in the country and you see all the mist rising uh, and the dew sort of burning off in the sun. Just all the black smoke, almost like a forest fire, really. All this bad, bad smoke of all negative karma, all evaporating, dissolving into the air as we're becoming crystal clear. And then like golden sunlight here, coming down from Buddha's heart, empowering us, kind of making us go up a level like in video game here, you know, all the wisdom, the compassion and power of Buddha. Okay, the four measurables. May everyone be happy. May everyone be free from misery. May no one ever be separated from their happiness. May everyone have equanimity free from hatred and attachment. Now that sort of golden light still coming down to give us love, compassion, joy, and equanimity. But now let's just sort of go inside of ourselves. If we can sort of look inside of ourselves uh, as a, uh, it's like we're hollow here, just at our, so, you know, we have just, it's like sort of a beautiful empty space, luminous empty space inside of ourselves. Uh, so it's not like we have uh, organic bodies of flesh and blood and bone and so forth and organs. Just at the heart level here, let's visualize Little tiny Buddha, just like Buddha Shakyamuni in front of us in the sky. This one's really small. Again, you can make them about the size if you want of a jelly bean, uh, or you can make them if you're good, uh, visualize him smaller, like a sunflower seed. Or if you're really good at visualizing, you can shrink them down to a sesame seed or a little mustard seed. Uh, but jelly bean's a good one, just because you can actually kind of look down and see it about that size. And we're gonna make this Buddha, uh, Buddha Shakyamuni, just like the one we're visualizing in the sky here, made out of uh, beautiful diamond. So just as this golden light's coming in, sort of activating this a bit here. So golden light like the sunshine and then at our heart. And we can feel that this is at the heart of all the other sentient beings as well around us. So it's not like we have it, no one else does, everybody has it but we're just gonna focus on it for ourselves here in particular. Beautiful sparkling diamond Buddha. And we'll just 
just finished the introductory prayers here. So seven limb practice, we prostrate with body, speech, and mind in three jewels. We make all different kinds of offerings, outer, inner, inner secret, and suchness offerings to the three jewels. We confess our negativities, uh, acknowledge them, own them, purify them. We rejoice in all the virtue and the goodness of ourselves, all sentient beings and holy beings. We request that all holy beings, all of our gurus, stay with us in this life and all future lives, and that they teach and they guide us. And then finally, we dedicate all of our merit here for the enlightenment of all sentient beings, everything that we're doing, even here right now, time together, and it could be the cause for the awakening of all beings. And just an offering of mandala here. We can sprinkle with perfume and spread with flowers the great mountain, four and sun and moon, seen as the Buddha land and off the west, and all beings enjoy such peace. Send forth this jeweled mandal as a beautiful, precious, purified universe as an offering. The final offering for our practice here to the Buddha Shakyamuni. Send it up here. Upon making this offering in gold and light comes down, in particular dissolving into the little diamond Buddha at our heart here, sort of activating it, getting it shining. We can visualize that Buddha Shakyamuni would please grant us your blessings, bless our body, speech, and mind. And sort of gets very, very small, dissolving into his heart in a divine cup, and then they get small, just like a little blue star, a little blue diamond itself. And they come to the crown of our head. And then they come and they dissolve into the diamond Buddha of our heart. So they meet and become the same thing. It's almost like some little puzzle game. There's two identical things and you put them together and they become one. We're just looking inside our body at this beautiful shining diamond Buddha of our heart. Just feel that this represents our Buddha nature. This represents our most subtle mind. Mind in Buddhism is defined as clear and cognizing. So it's clear and since it's like space, mind is nothing before it thinks, as Aristotle would say, around sheer openness to the world, this to sheer lucidity. Like light, when you turn on an empty room, like you move out of your house, you go one last look in an empty room of your house as you've moved out to say goodbye. And you start to put the light on, it's completely empty, just a sense of spaciousness there when the light goes on. That's what the mind is on a conventional level. You just feel that this root mind also has a very subtle prana that supports it and allows it to function and go together. Very subtle chi, just like the wind, the soft breeze, that kind of chi is super subtle and this clear mind that knows just allows things to appear as your experience to you. And know that ultimately, on an ultimate level, this mind is empty. And can know emptiness and emptiness in this mind are one. And this emptiness is like a diamond. So diamond mind and diamond emptiness go together to make a diamond Buddha at our heart. And just know that this is Buddha nature, Tathagata Garba. It's always there. It's always been there. It will always be there. Just like a diamond, it has a perfect diamond. It has no flaws or faults. You can't uh, do anything to destroy it. The emptiness of your mind is always empty, always there. And your mind is always clear and cognizing. Neither one of these things can be made into something that so no matter how bad you think you are, how many mistakes you've made, what an idiot you think you are, or what an idiot you've been, or whatever this life, past lives, that's done nothing to stain or stop or hold back 
or somehow degenerate or corrupt this bit of nature. It is always here and it's developing. We're slowly sort of crawling towards Buddhahood here, slowly taking up cleaning this diamond, cleaning it out. Allowing this little diamond Buddha to come out.
Okay, so slowly coming out of meditation. And you can always just feel because we always have our mind, we always have our awareness, and that everything is the nature of emptiness on an ultimate level. These things never leave us. They're basically, they're always present. We just don't see it. So we just throughout the day, if we can try and remember our little diamond Buddha at our heart, it's like a little guy where we have a little necklace on that's hanging down at our heart, uh, our little jewel here, and just always remember that, just to sort of focus on that, see that our liberation, we always see liberation in the palm of the hand, liberation's just at our heart here with us, not outside of us. Okay, so uh, here we go. That was uh, teaching that uh, meditation Sazabrim Pashimi used to do in Toronto about over 20 years ago. I've never forgotten that. Uh, like that little diamond Buddha at your heart. Okay, great. So uh, we did the um, uh, first class here, sort of. A, wasn't much of an introduction, just I read the sutra. So this will be the introduction to uh, the Diamond Cutter Sutra. And I have mentioned that email. Uh, ben Christian is uh, also uh, teaching this at the same time now. And I would really recommend that you uh, study with him if you get a chance on Patreon there. Uh, he's an expert at this, and he's taught it uh, numerous times. He's an old student of uh, Hitchin Michael Roach and just a very, very special teacher. And um, if you've ever done classes with him, it, it's amazing. I mean, hopefully you have enough time to sort of catch up and watch his diamond cutter stuff as well. He's a really good teacher compared to me sort of bumbling through the material the way, the way I do here in such an amateur way. Okay, so Diamond Cutter Sutra from ACI course number six, just my notes here and just stuff that I'm adding in. So um, the, in Sanskrit, it's called Vajra uh, Chadika, which means uh, the Vajra, of course, is diamond and then to cut. And it's Dorji Chupa in Tibetan. And sort of the idea in Tibetan, the direct translation is kind of like stone cord to cut. So um, that's what's, of course, you know, we, we talk about having Dorjes or Vajras all the time. This is, of course, is, you know, represents diamond as well, adamantine, right? Okay, so this is taught by the Buddha in 500 BC. Uh, one thing Geshe Michael put here, which is interesting, is that technically, if you can believe it, I didn't know this, but the Diamond Cutter Sutra was the first book ever printed, first book ever printed um, Chinese in China in uh, the, I guess, must have been probably in the second century or something. You could look that up maybe on Wikipedia, but this is, I guess, the first book that was ever sort of printed in almost sort of more of a modern way. And it was diamond cutters too. So that's kind of auspicious too. So famous Arya Sangha uh, gave commentary to it in 350 uh, AD. And Kamala Shila, the great uh, Buddhist master who also taught a lot on meditation, as you know, and uh, also from our Chit teaching said, uh, became uh, Bodhidharma and Padmasangha. In about 750 AD, he gave a commentary. And the one used by the uh, Glupa tradition in particular is Chone Drakpa Shedrup, uh, 1675 to 1748, wrote a Tibetan commentary called Sunlight on the Path to Freedom, which of course is a wonderful title. And that's sort of the commentary that all these notes are from. So uh, like uh, Zazar Rinpoche mentioned the other day, the diamond in one of his teachings there, the diamond cutter uh, is uh, very similar. When you read it, it, it sort of, it rings a lot like you, you, there's a lot of um, I guess you could say this similarities I'm, I'm trying to find a better word for that to the Heart Sutra and that's because technically it belongs to the Prajnaparamita group of teachings. So in other words it's Buddha's teachings on wisdom, wisdom on realizing emptiness, uh, wisdom of ultimate truth. So the meaning of Prajnaparamita is to perceive emptiness under the influence of bodhicitta. So of course, uh, Prajnaparamita teachings from Buddha are Mahayana teachings. And so it's not just about perceiving emptiness directly, it's about perceiving emptiness while also having a mind of great compassion and wanting to get enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings. So that love and compassion is in your mind while you're meditating on emptiness. That's sort of the, the great, the real meaning of Prajnaparamita. So first comment, uh, comment in the commentary is the obvious one that uh, I noticed, of course, first time I ever read the Diamond Cutter Sutra. Also, it, it's Diamond Cutter is the, the, the right translation. Oftentimes you just see it mentioned as the quote, Diamond Sutra. They're, they're the same thing. So, uh, but is Diamond Cutter Sutra 
And then the one thing that isn't mentioned in the sutra are diamonds, right? So you think, okay, well, this is almost like in, in deconstruction tactic, this would be quote unquote an oblique offering, so to speak. In other words, okay, how am I getting the idea of diamond from the text? How is the text telling me something indirectly, right? So <clears throat> diamond isn't mentioned anywhere in the text. So why is it in the title? It's in the title because diamond represents emptiness. The closest thing to emptiness is a diamond or why. So this, of course, if we, if you wanted to read Geshe Michael Roach's, uh, the big red book there on uh, diamond cutter, which is so good, he went into the diamond business. A lot of that book is just about diamonds. Uh, in, so you can read, that's an excellent book, of course, it's all about Diamond Cutter Sutra, a little bit more commentary than what we get here, but a lot goes in at the beginning of the book to just describing what diamonds are, how they're sort of created in nature, how we cut them, how we use them, and then why are they used as an analogy uh, for emptiness, like why do we have like a Dorje or a Vajra scepter representing, why is this like seen as a diamond scepter, a royal scepter of diamond? Why is it linked to emptiness? And the big thing is that, you, uh, I guess Michael says that, you know, they put it together because diamond is the closest thing we have to an idea of an ultimate, an ultimate something. You know, we always use the word, oh, that's ultimate, that's amazing, that's the best pizza or whatever. But, you know, we don't really know what ultimate or best is. Of course, it's a relative concept. So we're using metaphors here, especially with something like emptiness. Why pick the metaphor of a diamond? because it's the closest thing we have in nature to something being an ultimate. You can actually, you, know, you got, might have a diamond on your wedding ring, you can go to a jewelry store and handle diamonds and look at them. So you can just see how special they are. So the first one, uh, the quality of it is that you can't see it, okay? It's totally clear. This is something I didn't know, uh, except until I read that diamond cutter book, is that um, the reason you can actually see a diamond is um, that it has flaws in it, that it's not perfect. It reflects light because it doesn't have a perfect structure. So if Christina was here, she's outside doing uh, uh, Qigong right now, but uh, outside the room here, but she uh, did her PhD in organic chemistry from University of Toronto and taught chemistry for years in Vancouver and so forth. So she'd be able to come here and give you a better um, description of diamonds from an organic chemistry point of view. But really, of course, you know, with the from grade 11 chemistry here, hopefully I get it right, but you know, you've got a carbon bond, it has a carbon molecule has four bonds. So when carbon is attached to itself, pure carbon attached to itself, that's what creates a diamond. And those bonds are the most powerful bonds. Uh, so it's, it's like, a, it's the closest physical thing to a perfect structure in the universe for a diamond. So what's neat is that if you had a perfectly pure diamond with no flaws, it wasn't, didn't have any other atoms um, mixed in with it. It was just carbon attached to carbon. It wouldn't reflect light. It would be completely invisible. So that's in the book, Geshe Michael said, if you had a perfectly pure diamond wall, you would walk right into it. You'd hit, hit it. You wouldn't be able to see it. I think that's really, really awesome, really amazing. So anyway, your, your fancy diamond you paid a lot of money for that's sparkling is because it's, you can see it because it has flaws in it. So why is that uh, a good metaphor for emptiness? Is of course, emptiness is invisible. It's absolutely everywhere, right under your nose. Everything is empty, but you can't see it. And that's why we're using logic to get at it indirectly, uh, inferentially, because it's not, uh, it's not visible. And you can see this, like Rinpoche always says, logic is for something you can't see directly. Like I have my watch here. I don't doubt in any, unless we're doing some philosophy seminar and skepticism or something, but on the whole, in my day-to-day -day life, if I just see something here, I don't have to use logic or rationality to perceive it, right? I don't, like, unless, you know, whatever, you're like Descartes meditations or something, but on the whole, this is very clear to me. But, um, on the other hand, of course, when you're uh, looking at something like emptiness, which is complete and visible, it's all around us, but you don't see it. It's like a pure diamond. So you have to use uh, uh, reason or logic to get at it, to understand what emptiness is. 
So physically, uh, number two, it's the hardest thing in the universe. It's an ultimate, okay? So like it's the hardest thing. So sort of a, a diamond is something that's uh, ultimate. So uh, and that's another thing I didn't know. Of course, everybody here probably knows. Maybe I'm a dummy, but um, the only way to cut a diamond is with a diamond. So when they're cutting, you can read that book. You have a little, it's almost like a record player. It's like a revolving disc with diamonds on it spinning. And that's the, I guess, the, the cutting mechanism, their saw or whatever, and it goes down and then it can polish or cut a diamond. So it's interesting that a diamond cuts a diamond. So even when we're talking about diamond awareness, uh, realizing diamond emptiness, you know, it's all the same metaphor, which is interesting. Like I'm using my Vajra, uh, realization of emptiness like a diamond to cut through delusions so it's a good metaphor that way too in the sense that you know what cuts through the hardest bond of self-cherishing or self-grasping that no matter what even though it doesn't exist we're completely cling clinging to it is the hardest substance in the world which is a diamond's cutting through it of course the metaphor being wisdom realizing emptiness cutting through that bond uh, of your self-grasping and its structure is pure, number three. So in pieces, each piece of a diamond is another pure diamond. In other words, there's no more basic elements mixed with it like emptiness. So you can't break a diamond down into smaller parts of something that's not a diamond, like into other kinds of atoms or something. All parts of a diamond are like a diamond. So it's almost like a hologram where you take a little piece of the hologram and it's the whole thing. Um, you break a diamond up, you just get a whole bunch of more diamonds. So it's the same thing with emptiness. There's only one emptiness. Empty, and there's the emptiness of emptiness, but you can divide it into 60, you can divide it into a whole bunch of things, you know, three kinds of emptiness, 16 kinds of emptiness, da, 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 da. but in the end, they're all the same thing. It's just all like pieces of diamond. So um, cutter, of course, going back to the idea of why are we calling it diamond cutter? So what's the cutter part of the metaphor here for emptiness? So this refers to when you come out of a direct perception of emptiness, you see that every other perception you've ever had was mistaken. And this is what Buddhism means by illusory existence. You know your perceptions are wrong or inaccurate, but you can't stop yourself. In other words, they keep looking like they're not. So the path of seeing emptiness happens once in your infinite lives. Before this, you are but a child. So okay, in other words, where are we going with that? It says no. So basically the cutter is almost like, you know, again, you're cutting through illusion, cutting through ignorance. You've got your diamond knife and you cut through the veil of Maya to see things clearly. So when you have the, you know, it's the five paths, paths of accumulation, preparation, uh, path of seeing, and then meditation, habituation, finding no more learning or enlightenment, the path of seeing is that what you see also called path of insight is the point of when I go from having an intellectual uh, realization of emptiness and perceiving it through sort of an image or gen generic image or picture sort of concept and then I see it directly when I see emptiness directly seeing it like a pure diamond at that point the cutting through is that at that very point you see that it's the first time in your life or infinite lives that you've ever seen the truth that you've ever seen things clearly and properly so be the equivalent of having rose colored glasses or oh, i can't see these glasses as dark sunglasses that i can't see and then someone comes over and pulls your glasses off and you're like oh my god wow wow well, then you start to you see it was your glasses that were the mistake not, not anything outside of yourself it's the same thing. Once I see emptiness directly, I see this whole time where I've been grasping at myself, grasping at phenomena as if they were dualistically separate, as if they existed substantially, unchangingly, all these things that they weren't a product of, their, of my mind. Once I see emptiness directly, I see that that's always been wrong. I've never been right about anything in my life, but this is the one time I'm right. This is the one time I see the truth of things. So I, I perceive, I have a correct perception. And it, it's interesting, the little thing here, you be the path of seeing happens once in your infinite life. So there is one point in your, at one moment in your lifespan of many, many uh, lives that you're gonna get this and see through the card trick or the magician's trick and see through it and go, I got it. 
I got it. I'm seeing emptiness. This is it. So up to this point, yeah, you're still stuck in delusion. So the other thing is uh, they hear is um, the idea of a cutter. Um, da -da -da -da. Okay, it's just also, I guess you could say like it, it, they, uh, what's more powerful that like, you know, the, the example saying if you put a piece of diamond compared to a piece of wheat, uh, you know, of course the diamonds more hard and powerful can cut through things. So basically the, the wisdom of the diamond of seeing emptiness directly has a, a, a power just like to blow over like a, like a, you know, a, a whole bin of wheat, all your delusions to cut through all your delusions like wheat. And um, it's like the hardness of a diamond, the hardness of that truth. So it's another thing is that why this is seen as a cessation. It's like turning, it's not just like turning off the light. It's like ripping the wire of out of the wall. So you could never use that light outlet on your wall here. Um, once you see emptiness directly, you never go back. Like this is what you see where you become, you know, like a stream enter or even like an R hat once that this you're you're stabilized in that perception. Um, it's it's permanent, it's a cessation. You will never not um, you'll never fall out of that realization. It's like seeing through something, you know, seeing through an optical illusion, seeing through a card trick or a magic trick, seeing through a puzzle. You can't get tricked again. You won't make the mistake again. It's permanent. So it's a permanent alleviation of your ignorance and of your suffering. So that's the idea that it, it's powerful, more powerful than something, uh, you know, insubstantial, like a piece of weed or fluff or whatever, right? Okay, so, um, and that should be clear on, on the metaphor of the diamond cutter here. Okay, going into the next section here is Sabuti, who is um, Buddha's uh, disciple interlocutor here, asking Buddha questions in the um, sutra, is actually a manifestation or emanation of Manjushri. So, the Buddha of wisdom. So, they always say that. Many Buddhas appear, take the form of Buddha students to ask Buddha a question so everyone else in the audience has a chance to learn something. So Sabuti's so Manjushri asking a question and then Buddha gives the answer for us to learn. So what is Sabuti's questions? Basically, how should a Bodhisattva live? How should, like if you're a Bodhisattva, what's, what's the meaning of life for you? How, what's, your, what's your purpose? What's your path? How should you live? So the Diamond Cutter Sutra is Buddha's answer to this specific question, okay? So in other words, taking a little bit further, uh, how should a Buddha, Bodhisattva live? A uh, question really getting a little more details, how should a Bodhisattva think and act, you know, in your day-to-day -day life? What kind of person should you be? And in particular, how should you treat other people? What should you do as a bodhisattva with everybody around you, with all sentient beings around you? How are you supposed to act in relationship to them? Okay. So the answer, uh, you can see this in the sutra, uh, Dhammakara Sutra, is to take them to full nirvana, quote unquote, beyond grief. To, in other words, take them to enlightenment. That's what you should be doing. Your day to day, your day to day life, your path. What's what's the meaning of life? What should I do with my life, Buddha? Give me, give me, give me something here. What should I do? Well, you're, you know, basically it's bodhicitta. I mean, that's sort of the answer when you think about it. Is you should take them to full nirvana beyond grief. That should be your main purpose, your main goal in life. So, what does grief mean in this particular context? So, there's sort of three senses of what Buddha means here by grief. So the first one is the mental afflictions or delusions. Anything, of course, a Mara or inner demons, anything that disturbs your mind or a klesha. In other words, anything that gives you grief. So we all know uh, being uh, sentient beings running around being deluded people, just how much on a day-to-day -day basis, you're quote unquote given grief by the world, by other people, by the news, by your own body, by your job, whatever. Like, <laughs> you know, you live in a world of samsara. And of course, samsara is propelled or sort of the gas of samsara, of course, are all your delusions and active negative actions. So number two is karma, the other sense of grief, which things you did in the past, which you're experiencing now. Sense of, of course, in this case, being sort of negative karma you created in the past, ripening now to give you grief. And then, of course, three is the grief or the suffering part. 
you know, the actual, uh, I guess, effective content of this, the fact that you are suffering, you're given, things are giving you grief and you're experiencing grief in a wide sense, you're suffering. So this is the result of the other two. Of course, because we have delusions or clashes, we, number two, we act on them or create karma in regards to them, and then we sow the result or get the consequences from our actions and we suffer, okay? So that's what, in other words, what we want to do in our life as bodhisattvas is remove all this, take ourselves, take all sentient beings to nirvana beyond all these three issues, beyond our kleshas, our negative karmic actions, and our sufferings. Okay. Um, let me just see here. This is... Um, You know what? I'm actually going to end here because the next section on this, we'll end with a few questions, is on emptiness and seeing aspects or perceptions. And that's a, I've only got 10 minutes left and that's a big topic. So I think I should, um, I've got two full pages of notes here on that, but I know once I start explaining it, it'll go a lot, um, a lot deeper than that and then we're going to run out of time and i don't want to rush it so i'm going to leave that till next week unfortunately i prepared a little too much material here but i will sort of give a little sense of what it means so the next part of the commentary goes into an idea of what is dependent origination what it does it mean for something to dependently originate so it means basically that unless you label something a certain way then it doesn't exist as that for you. This is the ultimate meaning of dependent origination or emptiness according to high school press and Giga. So that's what we'll talk about next week is the idea of labeling something as a certain thing. Like I've talked about this in philosophy we call this an aspect or seeing something as something. In other words, seeing this as a watch appears to you as a watch. And of course, Kesha Michael's famous example, the pen is the chew toy, like I have my pen, my uh, dog's trying to chew on it or whatever. Of course, you know, this appears to me as a watch and this will appear to, to someone else, let's say as a dog or cat or a bird or a bear or something else, I mean, uh, the, or whatever, like, um, and it'll appear to even spirit beings as something different, let's say, right? So this is how it appears to me. So the emptiness is basically, um, again, unless you label something, then it doesn't exist for you as that thing for you. So that's what we'll talk about next week. This is sort of getting into sort of the deeper meaning of what the Diamond Cutter Sutra is about when we're talking about emptiness, of course. We had this big course on karma understand what karma is and we did talk about the of course the the main substantial relationship like the you know the inherent i don't want to say the term inherent that's the bad word but you know the relationship between karma and emptiness how they go together well diamond cutter sutra this takes it to the next step that we're actually going to look at how that works in terms of what they call concept formation or even language use how i use labels how i talk about things how i understand things conceptually and how that conceptual understanding creates things, creates the world I live in, and most of all, creates myself. And then we'll see you know, at the end of the course how much wiggle room we have with that, how much, you know, concepts are something that I do. So the, the, free, the question of freedom with Dharma is, do I have to do things this way? Do things have to look the way they look? does the world I live in have to be the way it is, particularly since it's going to go not working for me, what I want out of it, I'm not getting, you know, I want, so I'm getting the complete opposite of what I want here, right, in terms, so I'm rather than being happy or blissful or whatever, I'm getting suffering, so of course, this is the Buddha, the Buddhist therapeutic message here, and this is, like I say, we'll understand the more pragmatist side of this, and most of all, the message we're going to get here is the therapeutic side, why we're running around talking about concept formations and diamonds and emptiness. There's only one reason for this. It's not a philosophy class. We're not doing seminars. We're not writing books here. We're arguing with people to, to you know, we're doing this as a way of stopping suffering, as a way of bringing happiness into our life. It's, there, there has to be sort of a therapeutic consequence of this kind of a discussion so it's like Wittgenstein says of showing the fly out of the bottle where a little fly stuck in the bottle take the lid off comes out okay so that's that's that for now does anyone have any questions or want to share or 
just a few comments. Again, I'll try and leave some time in every, the end of every class if someone has a specific question on the material, so. This is more of an introduction, obviously, you know, I, I just uh, wanted to introduce the, uh, been any, anything on, anything on diamonds or <laughs> an emptiness, anything like that? Mm. Okay, well, if that's the case, if something comes up, please let me know, either it's just your email or just the next week you can bring it up. And um, actually next week, I think I'm gonna have to do a recording. I'm gonna be in uh, Brisbane, Australia. So I will do a recording for the class I just talked about. And I probably the week after I have off, I'll let everyone know by email when it's a live class. And I am back uh, at the end of the month for close to two, three weeks off in uh, November. I'll be doing retreat at home, but I'll be able to leave, uh, leave all the live classes for the first part of that month for sure. But I'll be in touch. Okay, so thank you so much. And uh, let's just take a moment to uh, dedicate here. And again, blessings of all holy beings, all of our gurus, in particular, Buddha Shakyamuni teaching us the Diamond Cutter Sutra, the truth of karma. We'll see just really more and more and deeper and deeper what karma means in terms of how we label things, how we create reality. So the truth of causes and their effects. And most of all, the most important thing, the power of a pure sphere intention of bodhicitta, that we're doing all this for the awakening, the enlightenment, and liberation of all sentient beings. By this, may all sentient beings reach awakening. And may all of our dharma wishes be fulfilled. Okay, thanks everybody. I'm gonna press stop here.